The Republic of Zambia lies in the center of Southern Africa. It has also been near the center of black African aspirations since it became an independent country in 1964. Zambia offers an important model for anyone interested in the movement for black majority rule in Southern Africa. Formerly known as Northern Rhodesia, Zambia is a landlocked state occupying the elevated plateau country of South Central Africa. At roughly 500 miles north to south and 750 miles east to west, Zambia has a total land area a little larger than the state of Texas or a little smaller than the South American country of Venezuela. It is bounded by eight countries, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Botswana to the south, Namibia and Angola to the west, Zaire and Tanzania on the north, and Malawi to the east. As a modern state, Zambia is a relative latecomer. In 1889, the private mining company of Cecil Rhodes received a charter from the British government granting it the right to rule the territory known as Northern Rhodesia. In 1923, power was transferred to the British colonial office and the country became a protectorate. In 1964, it became the independent republic of Zambia. While Zambia has traditionally had a very close relationship with South Africa and the other countries to the south, it has, since the earliest days of its independence, been a leader in the struggle against white minority rule. Lusaka, Zambia's capital city, is still a major focal point of attention in independent black Africa. Thirty years ago, this place was just a backwater. It was an unattractive British administrative post carved out of the surrounding African bush. The first capital was located in Livingston on the southern border. In 1934, the British government moved it north along the main rail line to a spot barely on the map. Lusaka became one of Africa's first planned capital cities. Within a year of independence, Lusaka had become a symbol of black aspirations. Today, its population is nearly a million people and its gleaming skyscraper facade along Cairo Road compares favorably to any African capital. The official language of trade and government here is English. While nearly 99% of the population is black, belonging to more than 70 different tribes and speaking as many languages, English is often the only language commonly understood by members of different ethnic groups. Despite its vast open countryside, Zambia is primarily an urban nation. Over half of its people, estimated to reach 11 million by the year 2000, live in cities. It is the third most urbanized country in Africa. One third of the population lives along the main north-south communications line, known as the line of rail, between Livingston in the south and the Copper Belt in the north. Most of the country's major cities lie along this route, including Lusaka in the middle. Zambia is one of the most stable nations in Africa today. Much of the credit for this stability must go to the country's long-lasting first president, Kenneth David Kaunda. A staunch opponent of racism, President Kaunda dominated Zambian politics since independence in 1964. Although the government is officially a one-party system, it has managed to maintain some human rights, an independent judiciary, and substantial political activity. But in Zambia, it is the president who maintains the power. Behind the facade of tall buildings along Cairo Road, one discovers the real heart of Lusaka. The city becomes a sprawling mix of shopping shanties, slums, and squatter settlements. Here we can see many of the problems common to third world countries. Unemployment, unmet expectations, a rising crime rate. This is probably a microcosm of Zambia's troubles as a whole. The future prospects for these people are probably as bleak as they are today, yet they must survive. So they make do, because they have to. Women form the backbone of this semi-legal trading market, which thrives on the outskirts of the city. They sell anything from canned fish, to yesterday's bananas, to sugarcane stalks, which have been trucked in from the countryside to sell at exorbitant prices. The lines form when something unusual arrives from South Africa, one of Zambia's major sources of imports. Domestic salt, 
cooking oil, shoes, or even toilet paper. Many products must be imported. But Lusaka does have its own basic economic infrastructure. This man repairs watches, for example. And there are many professionals and semi-professionals providing necessary services. In many respects, Lusaka could compare favorably to any big city of the third world. But there is more to Lusaka, away from the hustle bustle of the central city. For this is where the other half of the Zambian capital lives, where government leaders, civil servants, and other functionaries meet, where the hoi polloi of Lusaka society, white and black, might get together on any day of the week for lunch, and perhaps a dip in the pool. For Zambia is a true fusion of colors, cultures, peoples, and ideals. President Kaunda has called the country a federation of tribes rather than a nation. That federation today also has room for three ethnic minorities, colors, Asians, and Europeans. Together they make up slightly more than 1% of the population. And although the number of Europeans in Zambia has declined since independence, the non-African community still numbers above 50,000. For the most part, they have clung to the same social patterns they knew before independence. This group of Afrikaners gets together once a month. About 50 families living in the Lusaka area keep in touch this way. Many came here from South Africa 20 or 30 years ago. Most of them are farmers, and the economic impact they have upon the country far outweighs their numbers. In fact, the exact number of European farmers remaining in Zambia is not known. Perhaps only one or two hundred. But they are commercial farmers and responsible for more than half of Zambia's current farm output. One such man who was carved out of the bush, a minor farming paradise, is Buck Smith. He came from South Africa as a boy to make his life as a farmer. Why did he choose Zambia? To my mind, God's own country in, in my field, farming. I think it's the country for a, for a person to start farming with no knowledge of farming. But so was Rhodesia 20 years ago. Rhodesia was more developed. You Zambia you... was a challenge. Northern Rhodesia at that time was a challenge to you. And the land you took, was it raw? It was completely raw. We started from scratch. We had, if I say raw, we had 130 acres of cleared land. We didn't have a roof over our heads or hot or cold water. We had a fountain to bath in, my father and myself. So when the difficult times came, you had a lot of shortages, you had a lot of problems, you stayed on. You could have moved south to the easy life. Why? It's nice to battle. You've got to have a challenge, and if you've got a challenge in life, you've got something to battle for, to work for. If you get everything for free, if you walk into every store and buy everything, what's the pleasure in it? The British are also well represented in the farming community. The Cook family has been farming here for three generations. Most of the children have attended school in the south, in what is now Zimbabwe. The Cook sons plan to continue the family tradition of farming in Zambia, and they look to the future with bright prospects. Indeed, many commercial farmers in Zambia are doing well. Their fields are green and productive. This is in stark contrast to much of the native-owned farmland. 
most native farming is done on a subsistence level rather than as a commercial enterprise. The country is not totally self-sufficient in food, yet only 10% of Zambian land is being cultivated. Another 40% could become productive farmland. Plant almost anything here, and it grows. No one starves here. Life is very basic, but famine is not one of the problems. The only farm product which makes any real export earnings, however, is tobacco. The major export earnings in Zambia come from one source, mining. And from the mines comes copper. Copper is what attracted Cecil Rhodes here in the first place. In fact, the region has always been known for its copper deposits, as far back as the second century AD. Over 500 years ago, Portuguese sailors wrote about the mines of Bembe, and the famous explorer Livingston wrote that in 1868, he'd met a coastward bound caravan from here, carrying five tons of copper. Although intensive copper mining has been going on here for over half a century, the mines remain very rich. The average grade of copper ore mined around the world is little more than 1%, while the average grade here in Zambia is more than 3.5%. Today, the government owns most of the copper mines, which are clustered along the Zaharian border in the north-central part of the country. Most of the mines are open-pit strip mines. This one is the largest on the African continent. While Zambia's mines also produce cobalt, lead, zinc, and coal, copper production is by far the most important, providing 95% of the country's foreign exchange earnings. Zambia has about one-fifth of the world's known copper reserves. Development of the mining industry has nurtured a comfortable Zambian middle class. They are largely clustered around the main cities of the north. This is Kitwe, a moderate-sized town, which is almost totally oriented towards the mines. The Encarno smelter can be seen in the background. Another benefactor of the mines and the international community they draw to Zambia is the country's educational system. While nearly two-thirds of the adult population have never been to school, prospects for today's children are much better. Zambia has not yet introduced universal and compulsory education, but primary education is free for seven years. Enrollment is high, over 95%. These students are attending a private school in Lusaka, known as an international school. Surprisingly, it's the largest of three international schools on the African continent. It is fully multiracial, founded to serve the needs of the diplomatic community. The concept of international education is gathering momentum uh, for political reasons. Uh, diplomatic missions around the world want their children educated at home with their parents. And the only way they can do this, of course, is have schools that can educate those children at the post. Uh, business companies, feel the same way they can't get the people into developing nations in particular unless there are schools there that can cater to the needs of the children. The 80 plus teachers at the school come from all over the globe as do their students. Well, we have 52 different nationalities in our student body and 15 or 16 different nationalities in our teaching staff. At the other end of the economic spectrum, we find the vast majority of the Zambian people. Like these woodcarvers, they do what they know best. 
whatever they can. For there's no doubt that the Zambian economy is hard-pressed for international exchange currency. The shelves at the store are well stocked these days, but most of the goods must be imported. Much comes from down south, from South Africa. major paved road leading south from Lusaka to Livingston and the countries to the south is filled with large trucks bringing goods from the south and money must be found to pay for all this. <laughs> to the average Zambian though, the question is often not how much they earn but whether they and their families earn anything at all. Many of the people have simply grown accustomed to living at a subsistence level, at the bottom of the social and economic pyramid. But what about the next generation? What can the future offer these children? In a country where over two-thirds of the population is under the age of 21, where there is already a chronic shortage of jobs, where crime is the constant consequence of economic instability, what kind of world lies ahead for these young Zambians? and in a country where copper is so important to the economy. At present rates, known copper reserves will run out in 20 years. Certainly by then, great changes must come to Zambia. Perhaps the answer lies in the land itself. The country's rich, fertile soil might, in the long run, provide the answer to the enigma that is Zambia. In recent years, there has been, at all levels of society, an almost revolutionary swing back to the land. Out in the countryside, much of this vast country remains unspoiled and magnificent. The soil of Zambia is very rich. In the future, it could provide a more abundant life for the Zambian people.